Hello and welcome to Matt Parker's Math Solutions. This time we are looking at the solution to the unique distancing problem. This is the seventh of Matt Parker's Maths Puzzles. This was where you had to arrange n tokens, let's say, on an n by n grid such that every possible pairing is a unique distance compared to all the other possible pairings. And as people discovered reasonably quickly, it's comparatively straightforward for the smaller cases. So Anthony here sent in a nice animation for the n equals 3 grid, n equals 4, and n equals 5. And as you can see, there are several solutions. If you play around with it, these were not as complicated to find as the case for n equals 6, which is, of course, the one that we asked you to do. And as Anthony and a lot of you spotted, and I did not give this away in the original puzzle video, that's because of our friend, the 345 triangle. So this is the smallest Pythagorean triple, and so 5 is the first integer distance that you can get on a diagonal when you've got integer distances in the other directions. And the first time this becomes a problem is the n equals 6 grid, because if we go back uh, to Anthony's uh, fantastic animations here, it's not a problem on the n equals 5 grid, because even though you can now get a width of 4 going across, because you've got a fence post problem, because for the 5 grid, because you're going center to center, 4 is the longest distance, and you can get 3 going up, you can't get a orthogonal distance of 5 anywhere. And so up until 5, even though you can get a diagonal distance of 5, the possible distances orthogonally are completely separate to the possible distances on any of the diagonals, which means you can treat them totally separately. It's only when you go up to 6 that you can get a distance of 5 both diagonally and orthogonally, and that's where things get complicated. You can't treat them separately any longer. But for those of you who persisted, you may have found one of the two possible solutions. Here they are. So this is the actual solution to the problem. Anyone who submitted either one of these you got it correct. Great work. And there was no sneaky negative solution or orthogonal direction or anything like very straightforward this time. You put in one of those, you got it correct. We were, of course, keeping tabs on how many people put in different solutions. So Oliver, who runs our online submission form, was tracking which of these different people put in. And we were wondering, would one of them be more common than the other? And my goodness, yes! So the one on your left, we got that like 72.7% .7 of the time. That's about three quarters of the time, whereas the one on the right was only about one in four. That was about a quarter of the time. So like, why on earth is the one on the left three times more common than the one on the right? So for some reason, for whatever strategies people were using, the one on the left was more common. I'm like, is that... Is that a bias in how people were trying to search, search for it exhaustively using code? Like, how would you scan the space? Or is it just, if you're playing around with counters, is that like the easiest one to stumble across? Whereas the one on the right with its little, I mean, it's not a glider, but you know, a little clump in the bottom right hand corner, maybe that's just, it, either it takes longer to find that exhaustively because if you start counting from the top left, getting a clump in the bottom right, that's going to take a lot longer to get to. Or is it just when people were looking for solutions, that was an unlikely arrangement to put over there? I don't know. It's all speculation, but I thought it was very interesting that they were not equally likely to be discovered first by people as they were searching. And of course, we've taken out all the uh, rotations of the board and reflections of the board. And uh, people did very kindly send us in, like exhaustively, they found all of them. So Aswin R has uh, sent in, uh, it's probably a little hard to see on the screen there. Um, you know what, I'll paste below. They've got the coordinates for all of these. So if you want to see every solution and every orientation and being flipped, I'll put um, the actual coordinates below. And loads of people did solve this using code to just exhaustively eventually find one of them. And we had some great range. So uh, Deanna, who was going through the submissions uh, this week, she uh, put together all the different ways people did it. Of course, people were using Scratch, that's great. Python's always in there, pen and paper, and of course, physically just moving things around. 
um, that's fine. So what well on everyone who did these. Uh, Mathematica, interestingly, Noah found a way to solve it in Mathematica with code that was short enough to fit in a single 200 and, uh, well, they got it down to 267 characters of Mathematica code and they were able to put it in a single tweet. So that's, that's amazing, well done. So uh, Noah tweeted their solution. There's some of the um, plots that come out of uh, Mathematica. Other people did cool visualizations. Uh, so uh, name, Vez, Yves. Hey, whoever you are, great work. So as you can see, they've animated an exhaustive search. Hey, found one, there we go. Oh, look, searching again and They'll find one in a second. I oh, found one, there you go. So um, they did this, uh, they brute forced it. So it's uh, reasonably fast, they say, on a six by six grid, rather slow on a seven by seven grid. And so uh, because I kind of, the, the bonus question was what happens in the bigger grids, they uh, they wrote their code to exhaustively, oh, it's finished running, uh, search on a, I'll reset it, six by six grid, they then tried it on a seven and it slowed down um, substantially. And other people found the same thing. It gets harder and harder to search as the grids get bigger and bigger. So Eric here, um, they put some code together and this was all done in Python. And as you can see, they found there's one solution for seven by seven. That was the one bonus one that you could find. I said there were a non-zero number in bigger than the n equals six case. There was one for seven plus its reflections and rotations. Uh, so well done, Eric found that. They also exhaustively checked that there are none for eight by eight, there are none for nine by nine, and at 10 by 10, their code wouldn't finish. And depending on how efficient and clever your code is, you'll hit a point where it's just gonna take too long to run. And so uh, Eric's code here capped out, it, it checked nine by nine, uh, didn't do 10 by 10. Allison wrote some fantastic code, and I tweeted this. So if you follow me on Twitter, at Stand up maths. I tweeted this when Alison um, sent it in to me because they had an online form where you can go and you can click in counters. And as you can see, actually, I'm going to reset that one so it plays again. So uh, for the six, they can change the grid size, amazing. And when you click one, it will then gray out all the spots you can't go because it would be a duplicate distance if you went into one of those. So that's absolutely fantastic work, Alison. So uh, great work sending that in. Um, loved it. Uh, and you can, for her uh, interactive thing, you can go right up to a 99 by 99 grid. That's insane. Great work. Uh, Scott um, did this psychedelic thing. Don't look at that for too long. A lot of people did a thing using loci and a way of uh, crossing things out. Uh, Amy did it all in GeoGebra. I'll have a link to that as well. And they um, basically, they, they, they did every conceivable point on the 6x6. Six six. And then when they put in um, extra ones, they, they kept every conceivable spot available and just waited until one of them no longer had a line going through it. They went, that's the starting one required and then did it from there. I think to that. People did it theoretically, so Ray here, they um, did a bunch of working out and they did find the solution for seven, but they also showed that it's impossible to have solutions above 15. Because if you just look at the number of possible unique distances, for all the pairs, and you look at the number of possible, like the total number of pairs there will be, you run out of options. So above 15, there are not enough unique distances for each pair to have one of them. It's the pigeonhole principle, and uh, people did that various ways. Uh, Roland here did a similar thing using the pigeonhole principle in a spreadsheet. Didn't code it, did it with Excel equations, which counts as coding, that's amazing. And so you can show above 15, doesn't work because there's just not enough options available. And I do apologize, we haven't got enough time uh, to go through all the different uh, things people send in. So uh, Deanna very kindly went through all the submissions for this. And uh, with Oliver, they picked some honorable mentions for this time. So our honorable mention for Python code was Ella. Amazing work, Ella. And our honorable mention uh, for unusual code, Haskell, uh, was Mihaya. Uh, Mihai, that person. Great work. I have got to learn how to pronounce more names. Uh, in fact, uh, we'll have a link to the GitHub for the Haskell code um, below. Um, and Ella did say, by the way, she uh, pointed out the code, not the most efficient code in the world. That doesn't matter, Ella. The point and thing is you coded it and it works. All of my code is uh, terrible when it comes to efficiency. 
as previously discussed in other videos I've done. However, uh, your uh, code, Ella, was very well described. Great comments. So that's why you get honorable mention. Uh, Matthew uh, Perry here, chuck some code together and um, it, it, this was done. It assigns 10,000 random combinations and then checks if there's no duplicates in the distances. Uh, and then it calculates all the possible, oh my goodness. So it, it pretty much worked. And so we thought um, it was amazing because uh, like, this is all done in Excel as well. This is all Excel equations and formula. This is not done with, with like hard coding in Python or something. So that, that got, you know, as you know, we have a soft spot um, for uh, people who use spreadsheets around here. And um, uh, Imra here did a, uh, has a visualization showing, uh, I'm just seeing, oop, nope, doesn't run. Sorry, I've broken that. Uh, so this is the eight by eight board and they are unable to find a solution for that. And we're gonna have a link, there's, uh, the whole paper is on uh, Google Drive. So I'll have a link to that below if you wanna go um, check it out. And likewise, uh, Willem here looked at uh, bigger and bigger grids and uh, it's all up on GitHub. So I'll have a link to that below, you can check it out. Other people came in with some unusual sub findings. So a lot of people looked at taxi cab or Manhattan distances, this is where you ignore the diagonals and all you, you instead of for the diagonals, you do the staggered, you do like across and down, across and down, across and down, as if you're driving in a city. So Manhattan's the classic one where you can't drive through the blocks, but it is a grid. So you've got to do like a low resolution diagonal. And uh, what they found here, which is great. So um, on a three by three grid, any valid solution using the diagonals, the Euclidean distance, is also a valid Manhattan taxi cab distance. On a four by four grid, any valid solution using the Manhattan distance is also a valid Euclidean distance, but it's a strict subset. There are other Euclidean distances which no longer correspond to a Manhattan distance. And once you get to a five by five grid, no Manhattan solutions, they're all Euclidean. And so I like the fact that they did that as an Euler diagram. And uh, Lilac, Lilac uh, here did a similar thing looking at taxi cab numbers and um, uh, plotted where you uh, flip from one to the other. Which I thought was very nice. Thank you for sending in a plot. There you are. So that is the uh, wide range of solutions we were sent in and different ways of solving it. And so as far as we can tell, having done exhaustive searches and proving that there's not enough options 15 and above, that's it the only solution that exists beyond the two six by six ones is a single seven by seven grid. So well done, thank you so much. Everyone who sent that in, we really appreciate. Uh, everyone does all that hard work and tries to solve uh, these puzzles and we will get another one out um, next week. And bonus finally, for people who watch all the way to the end of the solution videos on the second channel of the puzzles on my second channel. This is a very, very small, strict subset again of people who watch uh, my videos. We put these um, puzzle videos together in our spare time. This is all done by volunteers. So I'm meant to be doing a bunch of writing and other work, but I love doing these. People love solving them. I love seeing the mass that comes in. Sadly, I haven't got enough time to go through everything, which is why everyone helps me out. And so we got Zoa, Zoe and Oliver, I combine Zoe and Oliver into one word. And uh, Deanna, as you can see, I'm very tired at the moment, uh, who helped me out with these things. You know what? We could use a few more people on the team giving us a hand. So if you're the sort of person who enjoys doing these puzzles, if you like finding other puzzles, more importantly, if you like checking through loads of submissions people have sent in, we would love you to give us a hand. So if you send an email to matpluspuzzles at standupmath.com, which everyone on the team um, can see, by the way, if you don't mind, if you want to help out, send in a little bit about yourself. And if you'd like to be a volunteer. So basically it would involve coming up with interesting puzzles that I can set as a Matt Parker's mass puzzle, and then going through all the submissions when they come in, because I cannot be trusted to see them all and depends how busy I am. So if you're happy to help us out, setting you know a puzzle every now and then, and going through all the stuff people send in to make sure we don't miss anything interesting, drop us an email. Tell us about yourself, why you want to get involved, what you do, all that jazz. It'd be nice to widen the team up a little bit, get some more, you know, wider range of people involved. That'd be great.
and we are undoubtedly going to get way more people offering their services than we can take up. So please do send in, but don't be offended if we can't use it. It'd be great to get a few more volunteers on the team and uh, you can give us a hand and everyone else just keep enjoying the puzzles, keep doing them, keep sending in interesting maths. Thanks.